And again, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And some of you I haven't seen for two years, so. Well, um, when they <clears throat> called and asked if I would introduce Jack Schmidt, I jumped at the chance. I've known Jack, uh, we, were, we were trying to figure out when we first met, at least since 1994, when I was on an old timers trip in the Grand Canyon at the um, Glen Canyon Environmental Studies that Bureau of Reclamation was doing, gathered all these old timers and me and the video crew and lots of other people and Jack. And then <clears throat> since that time, we've uh, stayed in touch. I've uh, spoken at Jack's classes. I've been on panels with him. Uh, we have, you know, we both have an intense interest in the Colorado River, and um, I've enjoyed that relationship a great deal over the years, and look forward to more. So, let me be real brief. Um, so, Jack was born in New Jersey. He is currently the Janet Quinney Lawson Chair in Colorado River Studies and Director of the Center of, for Colorado River Studies at Utah State University. In collaboration with students and many research friends, he has spent nearly 40 years studying the Colorado River and other rivers of the American West. He won the National Park Service Director's Award for Natural Resources Research for his career of work concerning the large regulated rivers of the National Park System. He was a member of the team who won the Partners in Conservation Award from the Secretary of the Interior for developing and implementing the pulse flow releases from Morelos Dam into the Colorado River Delta in Mexico in 2014. He served as chief of the U.S. Geological Survey's Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center between 2011 and 2014. Jack has a um, BS in poli sci from uh, Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, 1972, an MA in geography from Berkeley in 1974, and a PhD from Johns Hopkins in 1987. He is the winner of too many awards and author of too many peer-reviewed papers to list, has been a consultant for everything, from the Department of the Interior to local TV stations and everything in between, and a mentor of numerous students who've gone on to great things. I'm going to watch TV. He is someone I turn to for all things geomorphological, so, okay. and I feel like we're honored to have Jack this week. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, It's great to be here. What an honor to uh, have a chance to visit with all of you. Um, you know, as a college, as a lifelong professor, I'm a paid talker, and um, that can be dangerous. So, um, a couple things. Um, Somebody tell me how long I should talk right now because I have spent my life caring about the Colorado River and so I could go on forever. Somebody, when do you, was a speaker usually end? 8.30? 8.45? 8.15? What's the, the right number? Okay. All right, I'll, uh, I'll check in in a half an hour and see how the stamina is. How is that? Okay. Um, the second thing is um, uh, sort of not being entirely familiar with this great group of people. Um, I probably have overzealously uh, prepared in terms of material, and I am not going to try to, I'm not going to worry about covering every damn slide that I've got, uh, or to blow through things quickly. It's more important that we talk and understand whatever it is that I'm going to talk about. So, um, also, you should be um, uh, completely comfortable stopping and asking a question or say go back or say that again or anything that I might get wrong. Um, I'm going, and another warning, um, I'm going to show at least several um, uh, graphs. But knowing that I'm speaking to a group of 
a, uh, at least an important group of historians, I want to protect myself and point out that every graph I show, time is on the x-axis. So every graph is a historical graph. Um, and uh, I'm going to largely focus, I'm, we're going to warm up with a little bit of, of, of history, but my primary purpose today is to try to explain how we got into the situation we're in right now. I mean, we all live here in Utah. We read um, the newspapers. If we uh, watch uh, the, the, the media of any kind, the situation of the Colorado River and, it, and its challenge is utterly apparent to every one of us. And so it matters to all of us. And I'm going to try to just provide a story about how we got here. And then what are the challenges that lie ahead, OK? Um, this is a, a, a block diagram of the Colorado River watershed. And physiographically, the Colorado River watershed is divided into three parts. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Rim, primarily the high country of Colorado and the Continental Divide, and then extending up to the Wind River Range in Wyoming. And then the other big uh, mountain range uh, is the Uinta Mountains here in Utah. And on the south side of the, of the Uintas and in western Colorado, you know, we begin this vast expanse of the Colorado Plateau, this large, um, uplifted plateau of largely horizontally bedded sedimentary rocks with deep canyons. The Colorado River emerges out of the Colorado Plateau at the Grand Wash Cliffs and then flows across uh, the Great Basin to the head of its delta in Mexico. And uh, Powell wrote long ago that the general course of the river is from north to south and from great altitudes to the level of the sea. Thus, the river flows from the land of snow to the land of sun. And that really does tell us about the geography and the utilitarian value of the Colorado. And I'll just point out that for more than a century, the Colorado River has been also referred to as America's Nile. Because it is America's Nile. It's just flipped. We've inverted. The rivers are flowing in a different direction. But um, essentially, the Colorado River, like the Nile, um, has its sources of water in the distant, far exterior of the basin. In the case of the Nile, this is Uganda. This is Ethiopia. And the river flows across a middle uh, ground uh, where there traditionally has been, I mean, there's certainly more development in the case uh, uh, of the Nile, but this would be the Sudan. But then what was the real utilitarian use of the Nile? It was to sustain the great civilization of Egypt. And in the case of the Colorado, that civilization originally was the Imperial Valley in Southern California. But therein lies essentially the story of the Colorado River. We all know that when we think of the Colorado River, we think of John Wesley Powell. Uh, we're just uh, beyond the 150th anniversary of the Powell uh, expedition. Um, Powell launched at the railroad crossing at Green River, Wyoming, and uh, ran through the Green River into the Colorado River, and then uh, he ended his journey at the mouth of the Virgin River, and uh, several of his crew continued downstream. Uh, this trip was in 1869. 
So this is the first sort of full confirmation of the navigability, or at least the survivability, of a boat trip through uh, the deep canyons of the Colorado Plateau. And Powell floated some of the river and carried his boats around half the damn uh, river. Um, but what was that world like? What was the West like when Powell first came here? Um, California had the dominant population of the seven basin states uh, that are in the Colorado River Basin, but fewer people lived in California than lived in Philadelphia, which was the second largest city in the, uh, in the United States. And um, uh, 90, uh, 180, uh, 240, 250, the population of the other six states of the Colorado River Basin was less than the population of Baltimore. So this was a small place. Um, Utah and New Mexico essentially had more people living in, in those two states, or those two territories, obviously, um, than uh, any place other than California a very different world than today. At the same time that Powell floated and, and created the great drama of his expedition through the canyons of the Colorado River, the lower Colorado River that forms the California-Arizona border was a navigable street river. It was navigable by steamboats, Ships would come in to the mouth of the delta in Mexico, offload to smaller boats that would come through the delta and its many channels. And then Yuma was a transfer point to steamboats, to shallow draft steamboats that would then supply the mining camps and at some times of the year as far north as Colville at the mouth of the Virgin. So, the Colorado River was a navigable river. The first dangerous plot. You're all smart. I'm only uh, talking about graphs only because it's in the evening and we've all had dessert, so I know what I'm dealing with. In blue are the source areas of water of the Colorado River. Um, and so, um, and the width of these lines is proportional to the average annual flow of the river in the early 20th century when the initial agreements of how to allocate water were negotiated. And you can see that essentially there is no tributary with a significant thickness coming in these River representations are thick far back towards the mountains. That's telling us that most of the water got into the river in the far distant source areas. And we refer to the Colorado River across these arid areas as an exotic river. Exotic in the sense that it's carrying water just like the Nile from a distant source area across an arid land that it's largely disconnected from. And what I've shown here are average hydrographs of the river um, in the early 20th century, at the time the agreements were negotiated about how to allocate the water. This is the 1st of January, this is December 31st, you can think of the dark red line as the average hydrograph, and about 50% of the years are between the dashed lines. And the message here is that the shapes of all of these plots look the same, because this is the snowmelt flood coming out of the Rocky Mountains. The river is low in winter. We rise to flood, just like the rivers that we know here in Utah today. We had a big flood in late spring, and then the river receded again. A simple snowmelt hydrograph 
of the upper Colorado and of the Green River. Here, um, the gauge is near where Interstate 70 crosses the Green River and where we all stop to buy melons. And you can see that the San Juan River was a much smaller stream, right, with a much smaller, less severe uh, flood. And the sum of these three created the Colorado River through Grand Canyon, whose average floods were on the order of numbers like 80 to 100,000 cubic feet per second. Big floods and then low flood seasons. And then what's important is that flood passed all the way through. This is a gauge at Yuma and it passed this big flood into the Sea of Cortez, into the Gulf of California. That's the river of old that was then developed subsequent. The other distinctive attribute of the Colorado River is that it had a very high sediment load. In this stylized map of North America, the widths of the bars depict the, um, the magnitude of the natural sediment load of those rivers prior to significant human influence. And the message here is that the Colorado River delivered more sediment to the sea than any other river in North America except the Missouri River coming out of the Rocky Mountains. So that's another distinctive attribute of the river. Another distinctive attribute are the natural fluctuations of temperature in the river from being nearly freezing, even in Grand Canyon. I've got photos, old photos of river eddies covered in ice and ice at Lee's Ferry, and then the river being up into the 80s in Fahrenheit in the summer. So a big flood drops to low conditions, big high sediment load in some seasons, big fluctuations in temperature, a rigorous rapids in the canyons, and it, and it produce, or in that system, the native fishery of the system is a very unique fishery adopted and developed within that rigorous, very variable system. 75% of the native species of the Colorado River live nowhere else on the planet. That's the highest degree of endemism, the highest degree of a unique assemblage of native species of any large watershed in um, North America. The river of old was photographed in the 20s and also in the late 1800s. These are photographs in Browns Park on the north side of the Uintas. Uh, near the mouth of the San Rafael, big cottonwood gallery forests. Um, this is in the can uh, of Desolation Canyon, uh, narrow uh, riparian corridors, lots of sand. Here are Powell's boats in 1871. Here's Powell repairing some of his boats on the second expedition uh, down here at Swayze's Rapid near Green River, Utah. Here's Powell's boat in Marble Canyon uh, in 1872. Uh, there's a boat with his seat. Uh, the big rapids that all got portaged, right? So this is the river of old. And lastly, that big enormous flood, which came out into Mexico into a truly hot part of the world. 100,000 cubic feet per second every year, guaranteed, coming out into the super hot area, produce one of the most biologically productive places on North America. Because it was hot and it had water and it had a year-round growing season, 
ships could, uh, boats could come through here. And um, that area was most famously described by Aldo Leopold in a chapter in Sand County Almanac. It's a different world today. 40 million people now um, are dependent on the water supply of the Colorado River, a hydroelectric system that distributes electricity throughout the watershed, projects like the Central Arizona Project, which a uh, Central Utah Project that route water um, uh, out of um, uh, out of some of the streams draining out of the Uintas and ultimately into Strawberry Reservoir and into the Wasatch Front. The Central Arizona Project Canal, which takes water out of Lake Havasu and routes it to Phoenix and Tucson. And the Central Arizona Project will come back to us later in the story. The rules by which the river's water is allocated for utilitarian purposes. It began with an agreement in 1922, the Colorado River Compact, but then it evolved and changed and became more precise in a whole sequence of a treaty with Mexico, an upper basin compact, the Sup Supreme Court rulings, and other laws and administrative agreements. Collectively, we call of that the law of the river, and the state of Utah has been a participant in, uh, in most all of those agreements. And there's only a few key points that I want to highlight. One is we have the most important obligation is to deliver water to Mexico. We deliver to Mexico approximately 10% of the natural yield of the watershed. We use 90%. Um, there are senior rights. Anybody who was using the river before the Colorado River Compact in 1922 gets to use their water. And the most significant of those senior water rights is a water right that diverts water near Yuma at Imperial Dam into the Imperial Valley. That's a, that, uh, the All-American Canal has a capacity of nearly 5,000 cubic feet per second. It's bigger than rivers up here. At times of the year, the All-American Canal is the biggest river in California. And that water right is senior to any agreement. Um, the First Nations of, of the West, of the Basin, the, the Native American tribes, have rights based on the rulings of the U.S. Supreme Court. Those rights and that amount of water has not always been recognized and is only now continues to be recognized. That's a big wild card because those rights are senior in many cases. The water rights of the Ute tribe here in Utah, the Northern Ute tribe, their reservation, that treaty was signed by what president? Abraham Lincoln. That's an extremely senior water right but it's not quantified. And so those are big unknowns going forward. For a set of reasons that I'm not gonna talk about, the commitments to the lower basin, California, Arizona, and Nevada, are specific numbers that equal 7.5 million acre feet. I don't expect, let's just, uh, uh, 7.5 of something, okay? We'll talk about, we'll, we'll try to breathe some life into that in a minute. But the point is, it's a number total of 7.5 of which California gets more than half. Why would California get more than half 
when there's no contribution of water out of the state of California. That's because the principle of so much of water use in the West is whoever uses it first has senior rights, not where it came from, okay? And it's possible, and in many places, this can be interpreted to actually be 8.5, but let's not worry about the details of that. But let's just say that the upper basin, by the time these agreements were made, already, although the upper basin probably thought in the 1920s that they were going to get 7.5, lower basin was going to get 7.5, there was going to be another extra one. That was 16. Nobody cared about Mexico in the 1920s. Nobody cared about Native American, Native peoples in the, in the 1920s. But the assumption was that the amount of water in the system was a number like 17 to 20 million acre feet. And so we were dividing this up, but there was a whole lot more than that. But by the time the agreements in the upper basin were made, it was realized that, whoa, that was an unusually wet period when those agreements were first made. And in fact, there wasn't going to be a guaranteed amount in the upper basin. And so in the upper basin, we allocate water to the states by proportions. Utah gets 23% of whatever the number is so long as the lower basin gets a fixed number. So the upper basin gets the leftovers. Colorado gets 52%, Utah 23%. I just want to quickly remind us in three slides that there are many divergent views of the Colorado River. And the importance of the Colorado River as a water supply has been long recognized. This is E.C. LaRue's 1915 map of all the dam sites that could be built along the Colorado River, including the complete transformation of every part of the Grand Canyon into a series of dams. And there have been great schemes and I'll just show this 1947 uh, map of what was then conceived to be the central Utah project. That was going to increase irrigation throughout the Uinta Basin, and then by trading water and even canals, moving water all the way down uh, towards uh, Delta and Holden. And where was that water going to come from? That water was going to come from a great dam at the confluence of the Green and Yampa rivers in Echo Park. Or, as a secondary alternative, a tunnel was going to be drilled underneath the entire breadth of the Uinta Mountains to transfer water from Flaming Gorge Reservoir into the Uinta Basin. And the last slide to remind us is that the effort to develop the river also led to the rise of the modern environmental movement. And of course, we all know here in Utah, the great fight to stop the construction of Echo Park Dam. So with that long introduction, where are we at now? And this is what I want to try to explain. Okay, we got time on the, ax on the horizontal axis, so this is, uh, uh, I'm speaking to histor historians, okay? And every X or every cross is the estimated natural flow of the Colorado River back calculated from use data to basically estimate what would be in the river if there were no humans, essentially, you know, if we were dividing it up. And um, the black line is sort of a running uh, average. And then I've divided the, the, um, the, this into three periods. This is generally viewed by the scientific community. 
The period before 1929, average flow was 17.8 million acre feet. Only thing that you, the number isn't as important as in fact that 18 is bigger than the size of what was being divided in the compact. 15 plus 1, 16. We don't know what goes to Mexico, but we got a lot of water in the system. What we didn't recognize is this was an unprecedented wet period uh, over many centuries, an unusually wet period. <clears throat> From 1930 until the end of the 20th century, uh, natural flows at Lee's Ferry were a number like 14. Okay? 14's less than 18. So that's like, okay. And then where are we at today? Since 2000, the natural flow, if there were no humans in the watershed, 12.4 million acre feet. You do the math. Okay? Number like 12.4 is today's condition. We don't need to go through all the details here, but the average, if you average the consumptive uses of all the users of the Colorado River since 2000, and I have big spreadsheet, yeah, we all keep these things, we're all buried in the minutiae of this. The total consumptive uses and losses in the basin are 14 million. Um, let's look at a few key pieces. The actual uses in the lower basin in the 21st century, 7.4 million acre feet. Plus Mexico, 1.6. Plus, oh, we never thought to worry about evaporation from reservoirs. We forgot to count that. So 7.4 plus 1.6, that takes us to 9 plus another one plus, we're at a number like 10, just being released out of Hoover Dam. Use in the upper basin is half what use in the lower basin is. Of those, um, more than half of the water is used in the state of Colorado. Uh, Utah is the second uh, largest uh, consumptive user of water. Reservoir evaporation, primarily Lake Powell, is more than 700,000. Reservoir evaporation from Powell is almost the same amount as the total consumptive uses by the state of Utah. Now, I apologize, it's not going to be relentless grass, but just <laughs> buckle up, just a couple more, because I think that this is, I'm just trying to breathe life into newspaper articles that you read. Now, um, this is just 1980 to 2020. This is the duration of my professional career in the Colorado River. Um, and this is, uh, th th this is the uh, smooth line of the natural flow at Lee's Ferry. The really wet years of the 1980s when water flowed down State Street. Uh, then it got dry in the late 80s. It got wet again in the mid 90s. It got dry in the early 2000s. Rebounded a little bit in around 2010 got dry, got a little, we had a couple good years, and now we're in the tank again, okay? And in red is the total consumptive uses of the river. Now, the point here is that when blue is greater than red, we don't have a problem. When red is consistently greater than blue, we have a problem. So how is it possible that we could sustain 14 million acre feet of consumptive uses 
when the natural runoff was only 12.4? And the answer is that in the year 2000, coming off of this period, Powell and Meade were essentially full. And so we sustain this spending spree, even though our income into the checking account plummeted, by draining the reservoirs. And this is the storage in Lake Mead, this is the storage in Lake Powell, the sum is the total storage in the system, and this is about five-sixths of the total storage in the system. So, if I stopped right now at 8.30, should I go to 8.45? Yeah. yeah. It, um, if I stopped right now, the answer is, well, the consumptive uses are higher than the natural supply. We went on a spending spree, and we kept sustaining high uses. The supply was down. We sustained it by draining the reservoirs, and now we continue because, the, you know, it's still dry, right? Red is still higher than blue, except that we spent the bank account out. That's the crisis. Let me take a quick look just so we're clear on what happens to the Colorado River at the lower end, these are average numbers. That big blue arrow is the releases out of Hoover and Davis Dam on an average year. That's a big number, right? And then the river is, is bled off going to, this is going to uh, LA and San Diego and Orange County. This is going to Phoenix and Tucson. So we have less water left. It gets down to the Imperial, to Imperial Dam. Most of it's shunted into the Imperial Valley and the Couchella Irrigation District up by Palm Springs. The little bit that dribbles out comes down to Morelos Dam in Mexico. 100% of that water is diverted to the Mexicali Valley and nothing makes it to the sea. So it's a fully consumed system. And the one thing that I want to point out, I'll just use this map, um, is that the Yuma Irrigation District, the Imperial Valley, and the Mexicali Valley in Mexico produce 90% of the green vegetables and salad greens consumed in the United States and Canada between November and April. This is where it is all grown. So this is, I mean, one, we're not gonna be like cavalier about saying, oh, they just shouldn't have as much water, right? And then, um, uh, I, I think we got two more of these graphs. And, just to look at the details of how we got into this. This is just the total consumptive uses in the lower basin, plus Mexico. You can see that California was using a large amount, closer to 5 million acre feet in 2003. California dropped its water uses. There's a long political story to why that is, and California continues to drop its uses. And you can see this long, slow increase in use in Arizona. This is entirely the completion of the Central Arizona Project Canal to Phoenix, and then it being at full capacity. Okay? So what happened is in the late 80s and 90s, um, the Central Arizona Project Canal came online which changed the whole deal. California dropped its use. You can see the amount that goes to Mexico it has stayed the same. That's guaranteed by international treaty in Nevada. Um, just is tapped out and that's all it gets. Now on this graph, the vertical axis is the same as this. So you can compare 
and you can see the total amount of water consumed in the upper basin where we live is only half of this, right? And here's Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona were the second largest consumer. And the most important point here is that over these 40 years, the amount of water consumed in the upper basin really is the same. It doesn't change. The amount consumed in Colorado is about the same. Maybe it's growing a little bit here in Utah. It's not a significant change. In 40 years, it's still only half of what the lower basin uses. And this is, I wanted to share with you, this is just where water gets used in Utah because that's where we live. Um, this green is the total agricultural use of water in Utah. You can see that it's 70% of the total use. Um, a little less than 10% of the, um, or 15% is exported out of the Duchesne River Basin to the Wasatch Front. That's almost all of this. This is coal-fired power plants, largely. Um, and um, you can see some slight uptick. It's all about this. And these are the flakiest numbers, because these rely on estimations of evapotranspiration by agriculture. That's a much sketchier number with ambiguity than putting uh, measurement devices on the tunnels that take water out of Strawberry Reservoir into the Diamond Fork. So, um, but the point is, when you say, do we have excess water in Utah to develop? Well, you're certainly not going to say that we have excess unused supply. I mean, we're a tapped out system. But the flip side is, there's obviously a huge potential to trade agricultural water to other uses. I'm not advocating that by any means, but I mean, but that's what everybody talks about in the basin is the future of agriculture. <clears throat> the last thing to point out is this is just a different plot, but this is the same total use in the upper basin. And all of these colored swatches are old predictions of how much water use was absolutely unambiguously going to increase. This is the whole thing about fueling the notion of growth. The inevitability and therefore since it's going to grow we absolutely have to build the infrastructure to meet it. Well the reality is no matter who's made those predictions all the way back to 1980 the projections of future use have never been realized in the upper basin. It's remained flat. Um, today, right now, Monday, Powell is 24% full. Lake Mead is 32% full. The total storage of all other federal reservoirs in the system, 6.6 .6 million acre feet, is less than what's in Mead right now. So, I mean, Mead and Powell are where the action is. The total system's only 35% full. So the whole thing is about Powell and Mead. That's really all that matters. Flaming Gorge is always going to look full. Flaming Gorge has a capacity of about 10% of what Pal does or Mead has. So the fact that we store water in, pa in Flaming Gorge because there's less evaporation up there. But it's a small reservoir. And these are projections for the next two years of uh, likely elevations in Lake Pal. The reality is probably going to be somewhere between the green and the red lines. 
and this dashed line is minimum power pool. When it falls below that dashed line, the water level in PAL is too low to produce electricity. Meanwhile, PAL, uh, Mead is going to take another further plunge. <clears throat> this is some modeling work that my group did in asking the question if the future continues like the past. In other words, if the future is always 12 million acre feet. And if the upper basin were to grow like it imagines, and the lower basin doesn't change what it's doing, then within variability, this is the future for the next 40 years for the storage of water in Powell and Mead. And the only thing to see is this red line goes right to the dashed black line. The dashed black line is dead pool at both reservoirs. And the uncertainty would take it below dead pool, although that's hard to fit. Well, Vegas can still take water out. This is an extremely dangerous world. Well, this is an unacceptable world. As a good friend of mine who was the Assistant Secretary of Interior once said to me, the law of the river is whatever we say it is. And it's a reminder that we are in a time right now of the need for immense political courage and creativity. And the law of the river is being changed as we speak. They're all right now by short-term incremental agreements. And the latest one is at Reclamation. It was revealed in the, in the Triv and other papers last week that releases out of Powell are going to be dropped precipitously this spring and also next year. But there are going to be some big long-term agreements and this is just to remind us that the world in which we're rewriting the law of the river is a really different world. Um, Arizona is now the second largest state in the basin. Uh, Los Angeles and Phoenix are two of the five largest cities, metropolitan areas in the United States. Um, it's a very different world. And um, new agreements have to be made in this democracy. It is possible to sustainably, sustainably um, live with the river and achieve a different end with much more secure storage in Powell and Mead. But to do that, we would have to precipitously drop water use in the lower basin. And um, uh, the key is, uh, and I'm just going to blast past the, the next slide, so I'm just going to speak on this one. The negotiation is this. We're overspending the bank account. The upper basin states say, you guys in the lower basin use twice as much as us. We were promised equity. You were promised 7.5 and you got it. We were supposed to get 7.5. We're only using half. Therefore, we get to keep using. You're going to have to take all the cuts. The lower basin says, are you out of your mind? We have a whole infrastructure built on this. We have some of the largest economies on earth. We have some of the most valuable cropland on, you know, in the United States. You're crazy to think we're going to stop using it. Within the Upper Basin, the state of Colorado has just decided in the last week or two to just stop a program of voluntary cutbacks of, of agricultural users because they don't want to make progress for fear that they're going to lose their negotiating position with Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico. So they're not doing anything. In Utah, we're really not doing much at all. And so even though we're in this dire condition, 
we're in a situation metaphorically where we all have this joint checking account. And we all recognize that we are spending more than is our income. And we all look at each other and say, well, I'll spend a little bit less, but you need to spend a whole lot less. And the other guy says, well, I'm going to spend a little bit less, but you need to spend a whole lot less. And nobody, we're still playing a high stakes brinkmanship game. And that's where we're at today. Um, there are environmental consequences of this. And the primary environmental consequence is that that native fishery that was so unique was completely altered by dams, fragmentation, making the flow regimes different, on and on, dewatering streams. But also importantly, because state fish and game departments all over the West tossed in non-native reservoir fish for game fishing in the reservoirs and the trout fisheries immediately below in the tailwaters that many of us love to fish. And now the ecosystems are these new ecosystems that all developed in the 50 years when the reservoirs were relatively full, the water in the tailwaters was relatively cool. You had this symbiotic balance between native and non-native species of fish. As the reservoirs drop, the releases start skimming water off the top of those reservoirs. That water is much, much warmer than it's ever been before. And this is a plot of those natural ups and downs of the temperature at Lee's Ferry. And this is what the 50 years when Lake Powell was full was. A new ecosystem developed here. Now Powell is so low, it's taking water off the top again. The water's going to go really warm again, except you've got this mix of native and non-native fish. The interactions are uh, not predictable. And the Grand Canyon aquatic fishery is probably going to flip in unpredictable and unknown ways because suddenly now the reservoirs are so low. It's changing the nutrients, changing a zillion other things. Are people gonna worry about any environmental issue when health and safety of citizens throughout the United States is at stake? I can't tell you. But I can tell you that this is an immensely challenging and complicated world. And, um, you know, in some other form, we can talk about what citizens might want to think and do about this. But I wanted to share with you this message of how we got into it. It's not just about drought. It's about consumptive water use in relationship to drought. That we're in a situation now where nobody wants to raise their hand and say, I'll take the big cuts. Therefore, we live on the edge of catastrophe. Well, I mean, we live on the edge of crisis. And it has a potential to radically change the ecosystems of the river. I think that's a good place to stop. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'm happy to take questions, but all of you can go home and if you want, just whatever, whatever you want to do. I'm just here. You know, you must have your own personal uh, recommendations or thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah, as a state employee of the state government of Utah. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah, I do, well, there is absolutely no question that consumptive use has to be decreased. There are significant savings that can be potentially made, as I understand it, in the lower basin. I mean, for as much as the value of irrigated agriculture is hugely important in the winter down there, 
We certainly don't, we don't need to necessarily be irrigating alfalfa in the Imperial Valley when it's 120 degrees in the summer. So I don't know what the magnitude of that is, but there are savings to be had down there. Um, places like Las Vegas are the most water conserving cities in the United States. You're not going to squeeze any more water out of Vegas or Tucson. Um, you know, it's, it, it's frequently demonstrated that LA, Denver, what have you, have grown significantly, and yet their total water use has dropped. So I would say the cities are doing their share. Um, we're going to have, there's inevitably going to be water marketing and water exchanges out of agriculture. Um, I think that in the upper basin, um, we need truth in advertising. In the state of Utah, we should not be telling Utah citizens that the Lake Powell pipeline can be filled with excess water. There is no excess water. But you could say, we're going to fill it with water traded out of agriculture. But then we owe it to the citizens of Utah to identify where are those areas. Are we going to have a large-scale retirement of agriculture in the Uinta Basin? We ought to at least tell the people who live in the Uinta Basin that that's what's coming. And I don't think we're... So in the upper basin, when we propose new projects, and the Lake Powell Pipeline is not the only project. There are similar projects in Colorado as well. We need to be saying, where are we trading that water off? We have to give up the myth that there is um, um, excess water to be had. Um, it's inevitable that water is going to be traded out of agriculture. It's inevitable that agriculture is going to become more efficient. Um, that's a dangerous topic because the, leg the cultural legacy of farming communities to the self-identity of, of Utah's urban population is important. So you don't just suddenly wipe ag towns off the map. That's going to have to be done really sensitively. But there are going to have to be mandatory cuts in the upper basin. The upper basin cannot say, we're taking no cuts. We're just going to wait till the lower basin gives in completely. No, we need fixed hard rules of how we're going to cut use here and in Colorado and the upper basin's not doing it. So those would be the two things um, that I would do. I, I think that at some point one has to acknowledge the heretical concept that it may be better to store water mostly in mead or mostly in Powell, instead of keeping two pretty much empty reservoirs both evaporating off their surfaces. And, and, and we're going to have to do that. I, I, the law of the river is probably going to have to be changed. We might have to live in a system where highest economic uses are, go. It's such a radical change in thinking, and we're nowhere near that point. That's a few things. Yeah. Of the 70% or so of Utah water that's agricultural, what percentage of that is livestock feed? Yeah, that's a great question that I don't know, but I'm going to guess most of it. I mean, I, I mean, just as a casual guy driving down US 40 through the Uinta Basin lots of times, it all looks like alfalfa to me. Right. And it gets shipped to Asia. Some parts of it do, yes, yeah. So, right, and, and Castle Valley. I mean, it's all alfalfa. We don't need that much alfalfa. Well, I'm, I'm suggest I don't think we need that much alfalfa. Yeah. What, what percent uh, goes to golf courses? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, yeah, I'm not an endless, I, I don't have all these facts. Um, 
You know, if you're in Tucson, zero. They're next to sewage treatment plants, every one of them. Um, but I do understand that there's a lot of overwatering of golf courses in the Coachella Valley up at, you know, Indio to Palm Springs. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sir. Um, to what extent can desalination add to Southern California's water? You know, de when, you th when, when you think about what's the future going to be, um, you know, if you're a, you, you know, it, a young student figuring out a career and contributing to this issue, uh, go to an engineer, go to, you know, invent uh, low energy desal, low energy, um, uh, low cost desal. Um, desal is so expensive now that it's used only in the places in the planet that desperately need it. Israel, Saudi Arabia, places where there's no alternative. Um, the state of Arizona is exploring a plan and has begun conversations with Mexico to build, I think, three desal plants on the shores of the Gulf of California and then route that water by pipeline into Arizona. Um, at the same time, we got a desal plant at Yuma that's not even used. The, the technology and costs are astronomical. But 100 years from now, it has to be. I mean, I, I think that's far more likely than we're going to build a canal from Lake Superior. I mean, we're not, I mean, we're a country that can't maintain its bridges, that can't repair its highways. We're going to, uh, we can't reach agreement. We're in, uh, I mean, I get very worried about the capacity of this fractured democracy to respond to what's a true crisis. Um, I really do. Yeah. Could you talk about with your time on the contact and talking about governmental agencies renegotiating, talking, trying to figure this out? But could you talk about the role of the private industry? We are working with the largest water resource, uh, or rather, the largest home builder in the U.S. just bought Midler for nearly $300 billion and trade as a water, private water resource company throughout the Colorado Basin. Seems like we have private money chasing, throwing more and more money at getting a hold of the shrinking resource. So I wonder what you can say about private space. Yeah, I, well, you know, I mean, I started life, I'm just a geomorphologist who used to study sediment transport and now rivers change. Um, what I can say is that's real. Everything you just, yeah, that's absolutely it. There's a huge controversy. Um, when um, in West Slope, Colorado, um, the reaction was extreme. When word got out that private Wall Street firms were uh, looking to begin to position themselves to acquire large tracts of farmland to retire that water. And West Slope, Colorado went ballistic. And right now they're fighting it to the death. So this question of whether it ought to be private enterprise that does it, or whether governments need to shepherd, maintain the markets, maintain and set prices and sort of referee the exchange of water rights, I think that is a significant um, debate in front of us. And probably in this room, there would be great difference of opinion about whether private enterprise is more nimble to tra make these transactions or whether what that's going to lead to is the large scale death of ag communities all over the, the, the basin. Uh, I don't know the answer, but you are absolutely right and about that, and it is of great concern to traditional agriculture. I don't know any more than that. Yeah, Roy. <clears throat> Could you talk about the effect on the uh, fisheries and that of the new 
waterfalls that are developing as the lakes drop? Yeah, that's so. Um, if you come out of a Grand Canyon trip, you're going to float for 40 miles through Lake Mead on current. Used to be that you needed to get hauled out of there, 40 miles of rowing pancake flat water with an upstream wind. Now you're on current for 40 miles. But if you don't make, I mean, it's not like it's hard, but if you don't make the move, you know, if you don't get yourself to the boat ramp at Pierce Ferry to get out, right around the bend is a bigger rapid than the lava falls. There's a bigger rapid than the biggest rapid in Grand Canyon. It'll flip anything. And why? Because when the rivers go down, the rivers don't cut, don't always cut precisely where the river channel was. And so they end up cutting and end up hitting bedrock. And then they can't cut anymore. You get an unrunnable waterfall. Now, the irony is, is that in the case of Lake Mead, if you're a native fish biologist, you think that waterfall, Pierce Ferry Rapid, is the greatest thing that ever happened. Because what it does, it's unrunnable by reservoir fish. So all these bad reservoir fish can't come upstream. Meanwhile, the river in the last 50 miles of Grand Canyon is now warm, just like the old days. But it doesn't have non-natives because the non-natives can't get there. So it's viewed as probably the most intact, healthiest, most wonderful native fish community in the, in the watershed. Um, there's a waterfall on the San Juan River. Right below that waterfall on the San Juan River in Lake Powell, there's both native razorback suckers trying to get upstream to spawn and can't and bad smallmouth bass and non-natives that want to get upstream and can't, and that's good. And I would say that in the Lake Powell area, the focus of fish biologists is they don't like fragmentation, and they'd like to get rid of it. And in Grand Canyon, they like the waterfall, and they want to keep it. And it's a height of irony that people who care about the same resource have very different views. And if you're familiar with height, you've driven across a bridge driving from Blanding to Hanksville, um, the deal there is that um, as Powell keeps going down, the river at the new boat ramp, if anybody's taken off of the river at Cat from a Cataract Canyon trip, the river there is not where it's supposed to be. And if Powell keeps going down, that's going to end up being another waterfall. And now, are we going to blow up? What's reclamation going to do? What's the decision-making process? You just add cost upon cost upon cost. And which of these things are we going to do something about and which not? It's, a, it's a tough times. OK. Um, uh, yeah. And um, uh, I'll stick around if anybody's got questions, but everybody needs to get home and have a safe drive. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.